Yes. How can you sign the roster and not have your name on it? Oh, no, it's a different page. It's a different page. Oh, that's what I was saying before. Yeah. Only put your name on one of the pages of the roster that's going around. I don't know how many pages. There's like five or six different. Oh, there's three of them? Don't, no, 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 no. No, don't, do not sign it again. One time, one time per roster. If you already put your name on it, you're set. But it doesn't have to be every one of the pages. Just one, okay. All right, very good. I know, it's just such a basic concept. We're back. I'm back. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> so, you're back too? Okay, good. All right, so we're going to start in with our official lecture one, which is the uh, business aspect of software engineering. I think we're all excited. And half of us, what happened? All of us didn't come back. <laughs> all right. They're still thinking whether it is engineering or development. Excuse me? They're still thinking whether it's a development or engineering class. Oh, they're, they're, they, they're still trying to comprehend the concept of software engineering. Well, what did they sign up for? I don't know. Anyway. All right, so we're going to go for an hour, hour and a half-ish, ish, and then uh, uh, and then we'll take another break, so don't worry about it if you haven't uh, been able to get everything done that you needed to get done. Are we, are we good with I thought we were rolling. We are rolling. Are we not rolling? Can we just change no. the battery? Uh, do we need to change the battery? Not really required, but like, now it's going to start off for another three hours. Okay, well, an hour and a half. And then I'm going to take another break. That's it. Yeah? All right. It's All right. Okay, now we're really back now, and we actually have volume and batteries. We're good. All right, so the business aspect of software engineering, what is this all about? So <clears throat> what do we do as software engineers? We make business decisions because we can't just develop something and expect it to sell. Uh, so we have to make high-level decisions as to what features to put into the software, how to develop it so that we actually make something of, of quality. Big software projects are a strategic importance for organizations. Um, in fact, figuring out what version one, version two, version three, what features, what to put out, what to, you know, what price to put something on. Um, it's, it's actually a business. Software engineering in, in general is a business topic. So senior management has a duty to understand the strategic decisions, the cost options, and the risks. Because if um, you know, other things we can actually base costs on certain things. As an example, if you have a cost of good, I mean, you know, in a regular business problem, when you have inventory, it costs you something for that inventory to acquire it or to manufacture it or to make it. And then, you know, like if it costs you a dollar, you're going to sell it for, you know, maybe three dollars, hopefully, two dollars. You can sell it for more than a dollar. A lot of people sell software for less than what they paid for it because they don't know what they paid for it because they have to kind of calculate into the expense of building it. And unless you're a business person, unless you're actually calculating this out, you don't know how to cost it. Classic example, you are Acme Inc. You're five people who got together who decided to make this software package. And it took you a year and a half to make it. How much did it cost you? That's, a part, that's, a, that's an important question to ask because how do, you, how do you know what to price the thing at? So what ends up happening is people don't accumulate costs. They don't keep track of the expenses. They have no idea how many hours they've actually worked on something. Instead, they go out and they say, well, Acme Inc., we produced scanner software package as a generic product that they actually made, let's say, and that took them a year and a half. All they do is they go on the market and say, well, other scanner software is selling for $49.95. We'll sell ours for $49.95. And there's the price. But... When you think about it as a concept, how do you even know if you're making money off of that? How do you even know how many copies of that software you're going to sell? So you could actually kind of approach the entire concept of software engineering from a business perspective and make money at it <laughs> by figuring out what it actually does cost you, what you should actually sell something for, it, and not base it upon what everybody else is doing, which is what a lot of American companies actually do. In fact, if you go online and you start looking at software, it used to be everything was ninety nine ninety. Everything's forty nine ninety five today. I don't know why we we went down fifty bucks on almost everything because what people are willing to pay for software, I, I guess, went down. I mean, they're basing it upon some kind of artificial pricing model that they have. And the internet it has an interesting pricing model to it as well, especially you know, for for companies who like sell stuff on eBay or you sell stuff on your 
there's like you, you price it like a dollar under or a dollar over, and it, you're just looking at everybody else's price. But you can't really do that and make money and actually kind of plan it out like a business if you're building your own software and you're expecting to actually kind of do it for a living or to do it as a, a business or as a career. So senior management actually has to take a look at and make strateg strategic decisions on how many people to hire to work on something, how many hours is it really going to take, what resources are actually required, and then actually put a price on the value of whatever it is just so that you're actually making money on it in the future. Um, which is not something, it's not the, really the traditional method that a lot of software engineers take. If you think of, uh, you know, some of the high profile stuff, like uh, as an example, that whole movie, what was it, the social, social network or whatever, where they're, you know, the guy's, what, he, he's not making any money on it at all, if you think about it, on the whole Facebook concept. It wasn't about making money on it. It was about, what, producing something fun, something uh, for, actually, personally, I think it was about fame, but <laughs> it could have been, and that's the interesting thing is like, hey, what other careers do software engineers do something for fame and not for money? Other businesses out there in the world, they're doing something for money, hopefully, you know, why do it? So that's what kind of, you know, going back to this sort of the introduction to the course, that's another kind of weird thing about software engineering is like traditionally people don't actually think of it like a business. Like, you know, why do it unless you're going to make some money off of it? So people in senior level management, you can't think the same way you think about garage, building something in your garage or in, you know, for fun, for, for social reasons or for whatever kind of thinking that goes into some of these other projects. So senior personnel requirement, individual who is familiar with both the strategic business aspect and the computing <coughs> aspect of the projects that's going on. So that's one of the qualities they're looking for in terms of getting, like, higher up the food chain and getting in, into a position in which you can actually estimate something and figure out something and then you can actually plan a project. Because here's what happens. Uh, you decide, well, you know, you know how to program. So you put an ad up on a Craigslist. You say, ah, um, give me your software projects, I'll build them for you. You're now a new software development company. You give yourself a name, you got business cards or whatever. Someone comes to you and says, well, we need this driver built or something, or we need this project built. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're like pulling these numbers out of the sky. You know, oh, I can do it in a week, two weeks, and uh, mm, $2,000, all right? But you don't really know. And the only way you get good at this is by taking a loss, usually, the first couple of times. And because most people either under or overestimate, and then what ends up happening is if they overestimate, they're not going to get the job. Because your statement of work, you got, it's going to take you too long, it's going to cost you too much money, but maybe you're more realistic than somebody else who's going to undercut you. This actually happens in real businesses, too, with, with mature companies that build software. And then they don't, they end up making any money off of it because in order to get the bid, in order to get the contract, they totally undersold themselves <laughs> and they undercut the time. Or they made it impossible so that they spent all this time trying to put this thing together and the, the, the delivery date passes and the customer comes back, oh, we don't want it anymore. Because we had this other company at the same time, because the customer is allowed to hire more than one company, you know, to write the same project sometimes. Oh, we hired this company over here and they finished it for us already, you know. So they don't even take, they don't even pay you for your efforts of all that time and energy you put into it. So you do this and maybe, you, maybe you're lucky. And that, this is where, you know, is it really engineering? If you're guessing, you're lucky. All of a sudden, you know, oh, yeah, we finished it a day. And, oh, yeah, okay, so I made money off of it. Or, and then you go through life, like, you know, getting lucky, lucky, lucky. So is there luck in business? Yeah, there probably is sometimes luck in business. I mean, you guys are familiar with a pet rock? I mean, who knew in the United States you could actually pull a rock out of the dirt in the ground and sell it and call it a, you know, put some paint on it, call it a pet rock? So people rely upon this theory, this methodology for business strategy and software as well. They put together these programs, oh, wouldn't it be nice if it did this? Wouldn't it be nice if it did this? Then they stick it out there, which is how Shareware actually kind of started. People, grassroots kind of people putting together stuff and seeing if anyone wanted it. And instead of the opposite normal business models where you think of a product 
because there is a demand for it. And <laughs> you come out with a business plan for it. Instead, they come out with a product and then they come out with a plan to sell it. Like, here's our product. Happens all the time, still, even today, if you think about it on the internet. All this weird stuff that comes out. You know, it's like, who, would, like, actually, if you think about it, I mean, what's the concept of the iPad? You know, when it first came out, why, why do you want this thing? And people bought them without even knowing what they needed it for. In fact, people are still kind of wondering what it's for, actually. It's not really a notebook replacement. Now it's what is it? Now it's a, Xfinity has it as a TV remote control. <laughs> you know, or as a, you know, you schedule your stuff on it. But do you really want to pay five hundred dollars for a device to use as a remote control or to as a scheduler? I mean, that's kind of a weird, weird product from a professional organization that was wanted to put. Oh yeah, it's cool. They have. How many people need all these little iPad, i i i iPod things? You know, they're like. You know, clip on, little ones, big ones, pen ones. I don't know what they have now, but it's like somebody dreams of this stuff and they put it out there and they put a price on it and people come up with a use for it. It's got, it's, if you think about it in concept, you have to kind of step out of the box a little bit and kind of think about it. It's the exact opposite of real business. I mean, usually you find a niche in the market where you're missing something and you build a product to fit into that. And then you've got a model that you're working with, a traditional business model. And then you can price it all out. You can say, I am going to make two, this is how many of them I'm going to make because this is what the demand wants. And this is what it's going to cost me. And this is how much profit I'm going to make on it. And I'm going to schedule it out two years. You can't do that. I mean, talk, I mean this lecture is all about the business aspect of software engineering. If you remember anything, just think it's the exact opposite of, <laughs> of traditional business practices because you can't foresee oh, we need this product in the world. It's not necessarily what we're missing. It's, it's, it's sort of like, what if we make this, will anyone buy it? You know, and what can we use it for? And then what ends up happening is we end up with these products, these concepts that come out. If you think about all the features on your smartphone, they all became part of your smartphone from other concepts, you know, on the Android apps and all the iPhone apps that are out there, are all based upon other concepts that are unassociated with your phone or with the con of originally using it. I mean, you know, programs to get your emails, your voicemails, yeah, you know, games, toys. It's all just a duplication of other things that have come out, I mean, as a product line. So somebody had to think of it, and, you know, the thinking, and sometimes I wonder the thinking that goes into some of these products that we have on the market, you know, like how much thinking actually came into it. I mean, or is it just a spur-of-the-moment idea? And all of a sudden, it turned into somebody's business. So that's the business aspect, in a nutshell, of software engineering. All right, so let's take a look at it from a more traditional sense in terms of what the chief information officer... Well, so I think of IT, information systems, information technology. When I think of the business, when I truly think... When, I, when you kind of consider software in a corporate environment... I almost have to think, no software engineering. Now I'm thinking about information systems and information technology. Because if you take a look at the way that the industry kind of works, it kind of goes into, let's look at a real business and what the real business is doing, business tasks, and fit technology into that business. And this is kind of a like, strategic management information technology in other class. And I just had a flashback of some concepts of that particular class. What we're looking at is trying to figure out how to get a corp, like a corporate, like enforce a corporate structure or culture, how to get a competitive advantage, how to improve, make things more efficient, how to save costs, how to be more competitive, all these business related strategies. And we're using technology and software to complement that, to improve that, or to create that, to create new products and services that didn't exist before. And that's how actually software engineering kind of fits into the business and more of IT, IS. And what we're really looking at is kind of a chief information officer kind of person who's looking at data, who's looking at information systems and figuring out how to build software systems for the company to complement. So this person is usually a vice president, usually a high level person because they need to have like the business aspect, they need to know about the business tasks, the direction, the goals, what you know, what to do for the company in terms of uh, building software systems. And um, for a software development house, you're just like a manufacturer, essentially. 
So some some people when they think about software engineering as a business, you can either kind of you can take a kind of multiple extremes to the definition. You can think of it like you know Acme Inc, the software development house. But how many of those do we actually have out there? Not so many. We had a lot years ago. The growing trend now is now you're merged with other businesses. Now you're a department in an organization. You're not necessarily, there's, there's no real companies, unless you're an outsourced company, who's really just building software for a living. Now everybody's mixed in with corporations. So we have Apple and we have product development, software development as a sub part of it. So those of you are in and going, and going to end up working for another company, not a software development company, but one that does software development in-house perhaps. And then that's when you have to start looking at, well, what are the different, like the CIOs, the CTOs, and how do you get yourself fit into the management structure of that business? Because what ends up happening is if you just stay in software engineering, you're in software, you're developing, you're, you're in there for the rest of your career. You're not going anywhere. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of dead end if you think about it. <laughs> it's kind of a sad way of thinking about it, but unless you get out of software engineering, you're stuck. <laughs> Because you can't, there's no growth. Because it's not well defined in terms of the corporate structure. So I mean, here looking at a C, a chief information officer is pretty much the highest you can go as a software engineer because that's the executive vice, you know, it's the vice president level VP. There's no VP of software engineering at Apple. There's a CIO. There's a CTO. There's no software engineering VP. Is what I'm trying to tell you. But you can be the CIO and you can make major decisions such as what features to put into iTunes and what features to put into, you know, the, the, the OS and how to design the OS. And you're making pretty high-level decisions that are related to software engineering, also technology, also information, also data. So it's much broader. So the product manager, you don't want to be a product manager. Well, actually, you could be a product manager. It's a little lower than a CIO. Um, but what you're looking at then is uh, when software is a product or a part of a product, somebody must look over the product. It's another direction you go in in terms of business because now you become more of a marketing slash developer and everything is associated with the product. So you might be looking at, in terms of software development, the aspects of it, the function, the market, the sales, the packaging, the legal components of it. It's a um, glorified developer slash business position. Now, I'll tell you one thing, actually. C CIO, I mean, as, in terms of the business aspect of software engineering, might be a good goal. You'll probably make less as a CIO, as you will, as a product manager. Although the position's higher. So that's the other thing you get with software engineering that's different than some of the other traditional business goals or careers. Usually in regular business, Careers, marketing, sales, you know, the higher you get in the food chain, the more money you make, the more recognition you get. Software engineering is kind of different. It's more, the most expertise you have, the more well-defined your particular position is, the more money you make, the more valuable you are. It doesn't really matter if you're the CIO or not, or how far up you get in the food chain. It doesn't, it doesn't bring you anything more if, if money is your, uh, your goal. So, which most people, money, they're focused by money. I really don't care what title they put on me. How much are you going to pay me? This is the question you have to ask. So, Product managers make more than CIOs. Some of them actually make you know, significantly am larger amounts because they're more valuable because they're closely niched to the, they're closely tied to the software. And we have in the in-house computing department, as I mentioned before, so we don't have Acme Inc. anymore. Well, we do. There's no reason why. In fact, if this were the entrepreneurial software engineering course or whatever, I don't think we have one here, you would be thinking about owning your own software and development company. Hard to do. Hard to do. We have some companies out there still. We have Semantics, well, or antivirus software. We have Norton stuff. We have companies that specialize, but we don't have any too, too many successful. All we do is make and sell software, unless you're an outsourced company. And you're working with outsourced product, and they're going away, actually. Which is kind of it's kind of a weird market right now, I should say. So, in terms of the in-house computing department, we're looking at the organization centralized computing department reporting to the chief information officer. 
and that's the, pretty much the structure that I described a few minutes ago. We have a decentralized model with computing distributed across the organization. We could have um, each department might actually have their own software development slash IT slash IS function, cross-functional thing. Usually with the expertise, we have a full in-house design software development expertise exists, no coding. So um, to, um, you guys have all heard about outsourcing because you guys have all par probably participated in it perhaps is what my guess is. Um, so, you know, what ended up happening from the other, from the other part you probably didn't see from the U.S. perspective of it is they said, well, outsourcing. So now we're XYZ company and we are building a product and now we have all of our in-house software development going on because we don't work with Acme Inc. anymore. Instead, we acquired them. Now they're, they're part of our organization. So let's outsource it. Let's not even use our in-house anymore. So what ended up happening is they said, well, okay, just you know, have those other guys build it. Take it overseas or something. Take it out of the country. Take it somewhere else, right? And then they forgot, oh, we have to manage this project. <laughs> like, we actually have to put together requirements, documents, and we actually have to figure out, we, have to, we should probably design this. Oh, I'll just let them design it. And anyway, the model failed miserably, actually. In fact, a lot of people you know, are still saying that outsourcing is going to go away completely. It's not going to go away completely. It's still, in some cases, a little cheaper if you do it correctly. But there's a whole model to that where you actually have to think about the development process. You still have to plan for it. You still have to cost it out. You still have to put together requirements, maybe even design it, because the software doesn't sit, no software sits on an island of its own anymore. Everything works with something else, a network system, other software. You still have to integrate it. You still have to implement it somehow. Just because you have somebody else code it doesn't necessarily mean you have to get to skip all those other steps. So now, actually, the growing trend now is that more, most of the in-house software development is doing almost everything outside of the coding. And it's kind of like going back to that concept of building a house. Um, you know, you can get an architect. You can buy the land, get the architect get all the drawings put together, get the whole thing planned out completely, send your plan to five different contractors, construction companies, pick the best bid you want and have it built. Well, that's how you build software nowadays. So the only thing that we're outsourcing is the build. It's just here's the plan, here's the architectural design, code it for us. That works, that model works, um, which is kind of like how outsourcing is working these days. We're still planning it, we're still doing the architectural design, we put everything in-house. Uh, which is what you do in software engineering, which is kind of interesting because depending upon where you take software engineering courses, in the old days it used to be, they used to teach you a bunch of programming. You, know, you, you signed up for a master's degree in software engineering, you learned Java and C++ and everything. You know, so that was software engineering. It's not software engineering anymore. <laughs> now software engineering is architectural designs. And now it's, it's, it's how, to, how to use the methodologies correctly and how to do QA correctly and how to do all this other stuff. They can get a trained monkey to do the coding. You don't need to learn programming. Now, I hate to tell you, but you don't actually need to have technical skills anymore to be successful in software engineering. And in fact, in-house people, they don't want to hire programmers because programmers can be outsourced. You can always outsource someone to write the code for you. <coughs> so software houses... Another trend, um, what are the software houses doing? They're providing the services. So instead of development, because nobody, nobody disagreed with me. Usually I have a couple people, well, you guys are just quiet today. Now you have a couple people, no, there's still, still companies out there that are doing development. I work for one. And when you probably do consulting for one. Actually, most of you probably have consulting jobs with companies who have contracts with other companies to produce software solutions for problems. That's what software houses do. They're not Acme Inc. software development anymore. The nature of what they're doing is slightly different. Instead, they're providing services. So what you can do, in fact, is what most people actually end up doing. If you don't want to work for a big company like Apple and you don't want to go through the whole CIO, you know, information systems, technology, slash software development route, and only be assigned and only do business stuff, you want to do programming, or you want to do SAP, or you want to do something in particular, you work for Software House. This is what the business is all about these days. And um, what you get is a company that creates software for other organizations. 
And that's all they do. But they specialize usually in SAP or something. They specialize in PeopleSoft or Oracle or something. And that's where you can kind of take your career and go, well, I just want to do database design and I just want to work with Oracle. And then you end up with a consultancy or something at one of these companies with these houses. And these houses actually organize everything for you. The business is a mixture of consulting, packages, custom software, maintenance, education. Some of them actually just do training. Because actually things like PeopleSoft, extremely difficult. So you outsource a company, I shouldn't say outsource, you go with a software house that produces a solution for you and then you use the software house to train your people. So you have people that work for the software consultancy company that are educators, that are trainers, that go out to company sites and train people on how to do stuff. Um, and they, they don't have any, they don't develop software at all. I mean, personally, they don't do that job. So because large sums of money are involved, emphasis should be on the concepts of visible processes, well-defined deliverables, and acceptance testing, and stuff like that. So that's where the software development or software engineering concept mixes in. And then we have the business model to consider. So we actually have different business models that are associated with these different houses and consultancies. So software is tailored to specific environments. So depending upon the environment that the consultancy company slash house is working with, their methodologies and their model is going to be different. Some of them are nothing more than they act like headhunter companies. And you probably are familiar with this concept as well. You go and you work for the software company, the software house, and everybody's job is different. And they're acting sort of like a headhunter or a, almost like a human resource department. They pay you, they send you out, and you fix problems. It's kind of like Maytag Repairman, almost, but for software. You go out and you fix this problem. You go out and you fix that problem. Or you work on short-term contracts as a software, like a database architect. You go out to this company and you design, you do architectural work for them. You go to this other company, maybe simultaneously you're working both. And you're doing database architect for that company. Okay. So it's, special, it's almost like a, a head, a, you guys are familiar with the term headhunter? It's like, a, actually, do I have to explain it? Do you know headhunting? No? The Indians, they got the, the no, 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 they chop your head off? No? <laughs> no? You were going to answer it. No, that's all right. Headhunting? Eh, forget it. And, uh, you know, recruiter, mm, I don't know. They used to call them headhunters. I don't know if that's politically correct these days, though, but you know, I don't have any American Indians in this class, so we're good. The American Indians don't like headhunting. You know, just chop the head off, hold you by the head by the hair. Oh, look, we found one. <laughs> that's how they go catch skilled people. Anyway, now I still remember that. Y'all come, she talked about cutting people's heads off and holding them by the hair. <laughs> Dangling them around. All right, those are headhunters. Those find, they find good people. For you, consultancies, I guess, is the, the term you guys are familiar with when you, get, when you work for a consultancy. All right, back to, the, uh, back to the concept I'm trying to talk about. The company could just be like a turnkey kind of, this person gets in, gets connected to that person. This person gets, that's what headhunters do. They find people and they connect them to people who need to find those people, and they're just the mediator. They're in between, um, which is what a lot of software development houses actually do. However, what they do is what you don't do, and what you could do. If you're a software developer, engineer type person who knows how to code, knows how to, do you really know how to price things out? Do you know how many hours it's going to take you, how many hours it should take you? So like at least what these headhunters do is they know, they already know the business aspect of it. They know how many hours it's going to take. There's a lot of people who successfully do this. They have the background, they know how many, what combination of people it takes with how many hours and how much money and how much resources. And they're the middleman. They say, okay, yeah, here we go. Here's A, B, and C people. Considering that people are all the same, perhaps, and that they can all do the same thing and they're irreplaceable, you just mix, switch, match people. And they go, okay, give me $10,000. They go out and spend $5,000 on the people and the price, you know, on the time and the energy, and blah, blah, blah. And then they make the profit because they know how to do it from a business perspective, they know how to price it out, um, which is what they're doing, essentially, in the model, because and you're thinking about, well, why can't the software people do it? Because everybody knows they all make mistakes. 
they all they don't know how to do it is what the problem is because they're all they're good programmers but they're not good business people so that's the, the point I was trying to drive home on that concept packaging with modifications oh here's another thing we do uh, we can come up with one package in fact this is what a lot of the tools companies they work with Oracle tools, they work with solutions. Sometimes a lot of SAP stuff is done this way, people saw solutions. You know something well, you got a package that you put together as your Acme Inc. company, and you're selling the same package with modifications to different companies. That's still it, that's still around, that still exists. So you're developing general purpose packages. The client licenses the package. It's kind of like how big companies sell packages to small people, to individual users, but why sell it to like thousands and thousands of users when you can just sell it to five companies maybe, five or six companies, and you can c continuously collect revenue on that, um, hopefully, through upgrades and things like that. Uh, software code is modified for the client's specific needs. This is what ended up happening with a lot of outsourcing. <laughs> so what ended up happening, nice, nice concept to just start out with. You know, the, the American company said, oh, we need this accounting program, and I need it written, and these are all the things I want. They didn't bother doing the engineering part of it. They didn't bother coming up with requirements. We just need an accounting program. Oh, outsourcing, that's what everybody's doing now. So they got this manager who went and found this outsourced company to build it for him. Well, they didn't realize it, but this outsourced company is doing prepackaged modifications. They already have the accounting program. In fact, that's the interesting thing is, if you go randomly call up some of these companies, uh, actually you can find them all over the internet, and you say, how long will it take to get my new accounting program? Oh, we can have it to you tomorrow. And you're thinking, how in the world can they build this whole thing in one day? You know, it takes months to build this thing. And what they're not telling you, believe it or not, these idiots actually fall for this. And they go, oh, no, it's custom built for us. Yeah, it's going to have this feature. Yeah, yeah, it's going to have everything. You're going to build it for us. It's our program. Yeah. <laughs> they sold the same program to everybody else out there. So, and then, but they're selling it to you as if it's your program. And it, believe it or not, it's still going on today. You can do it today, this afternoon. Call some, you know, one of these companies. And they'll, oh, yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> we'll give it to you. You know, MP3 recording, uh, translations, encoding, uh, algorithm stuff. It's all copied, pirated, per, you know, or it's being sold to everybody else. And, being, and, and, and they're trying to make you believe. Or sometimes they're honest and they tell you ahead of time. Oh, no, 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 no. And then that's when you, the negotiations start with the licensing. Well, how long can we use this for? And who else is using it? And then all of a sudden you figure out. And they also did this. So what ended up happening with outsourcing is a lot of these companies sold trade secrets for other companies. You know, oh, this is how they do their accounting. This is how they do this, that. And you want this feature too, right? You know, and then all of a sudden, if you're the originator of this concept, you're pissed off. You're suing the outsource company because they just sold all of your trade secrets and your special way of doing something. Now you're not competitive anymore. And that's one of the loopholes that prepackaged software runs into. And it only works for small startups usually. If you must have an accounting program and the one that you're using is not sufficient, then you go with this type of packaging, you know, because it's quick and it's easy. In terms of the business consideration, the modifications, um, maybe by software houses or in-house teams, um, part of the problem with this is who can modify it. Nobody wants to sell the source code because they want to lock you in. And you get, you get what's called vendor lock-in. So you go with this prepackaged solution. It's an SAP system that's working with this database and this other features. And the company that sold it to you is the only one who actually has access to the code who can actually make modifications. And so it's kind of like, OK, gotcha. <laughs> you want something done with it in the future? You're going to have to pay us. And then it's repeat customer. Well, a lot of companies don't like that. But it's a trap. Again, another trap that some people fall into. And so if you can actually get the source code, which you're probably not going to get, because then why you can just take and resell that if you wanted to. So the company's never going to sell you that if they're, if they're doing a prepackaged kind of thing, which is kind of interesting because some consulting outsource companies, the ones that won't give you the code, you know, everybody else on the block has the same program. <laughs> they're reselling it all over again. So maintenance is an issue with that. 
Legal issues include uh, maybe the access to the source code, the ownership of the source code, and then we have an entire lecture on that issue itself, actually, in the type, you know, who owns the source code, who owns the copyright. Examples, corporate payroll systems, accounting systems, small business systems. Um, you end up in a situation in which, um, you know, you end up with a legal battle in the end because, you know, you have something that you own, but you can't modify it. And then you can't modify it unless you pay those other people who made it for you. And then, or, you know, also, also issues of, you know, trade secrets and stuff like that being lost. Uh, packages without modifications. Uh, these are uh, licensed packages in binary form only. No source code, no modification, no agreement, no consultancy. They just make something for you and they give it to you. Problem is, eventually you're going to wear, it's going to wear out and you can't do anything with it. It's kind of like how people use software. You buy Microsoft Word. Well, what about upgrades? What about patches? What about if I buy Windows 7? I get Windows 7, but I also get upgrades and support and things. So that ends up being the issue with how much support is free. What, am I, what have I paid for? What, have I, what am I getting? Packages typically have many different options, including configuration options. That works out well. When you want to buy, going back to the accounting example, you know, you're a startup company, maybe you don't need payroll yet, but you don't have to buy it yet. So you buy this module, this module, this one. You just keep buying more modules to get more functionality. That, actually, that model actually works quite well. And uh, it allows the software de development company to come up with a prepackaged solution, sell it in modules, and keep selling add-ons. Oh, yeah, okay, we have this add-on. We have that add-on. Um, antivirus programs started doing that about a year, well, about five years ago or so when they had antivirus. Now they have spyware. Now they have firewall. Now they have all this other components that you can buy to go along with it. And you're not really special, you're not customizing it in terms of what it's doing, you're customizing the modules that you're buying. So it's prepackaged, ready to go. A little easier, a little, a little more generic, easier to upgrade, actually. Uh, packages may be self-contained applications themselves, components. They might be incorporated into a larger application, or they might just be standalone components. They might actually work. In fact, network companies do that. You know, do you want monitoring? Do you want this? Do you want that? And you just keep adding it on. Legal considerations, usually there is a clear distinction between the package and the application, hopefully. Um, sometimes there's this package you buy, and the thing's disabled or something is disabled, and then you wonder, well, didn't I buy that? Don't really get that much, because now people won't buy it. They'll just download it for free. <laughs> they'll use it, and they go, well, this has been disabled ever since I've gotten it, which is kind of like what AVG does, if you use that. Actually, AVG is kind of interesting. If you guys use AVG, yeah, anti exactly. yeah free antivirus yeah. software. Yeah, the little trick to it, though, if you, get, if you actually pay for it, you get a faster running version of it. <laughs> And uh, some of the features of the free version are there, but they're not working. Although you see them there, and they look like they're there and they're running, but they're not running, actually. They're not running. It's, it's kind of interesting, but it's kind of a good ploy to get you to pay for it, too, I think. But anyway, it's not a bad idea. And that actually brings up a totally different model. That goes back from the old demo, free, freeware, shareware, open source kind of model. But it, it's kind of different, though. Their whole ploy is in the marketing. <laughs> Showing you the features, and then they send you those terrible, nasty reminder messages about upgrading and stuff like that, too. So. All right. Uh, an example here might be a database system, mathematical packages, and stuff like that. And actually, what I liked was like when they used to sell you database systems with applications, but they didn't allow you to use the database system outside of the application. So some of these people like shipped you an entire Oracle system that was built with a, a POS, point of sale, or some sort of transaction management. But if you tried to use the Oracle without the application, it wasn't working when they shut it off completely. It's because they sold you a runtime version instead of the real version or something. And they got special licensing for it. So, and sometimes you might have expected to be able to use the Oracle to add another application to it or to do some modification. And then you discovered you were locked in, or locked out, excuse me, that you couldn't use it. Big business model embedded systems. Uh, wave of the future. Everything's smaller, smaller, and smaller, and on the chips now. <laughs> no more computer. Software bundled with hardware products. So the software that comes with your phone, 
is kind of an example of this, your Android operating system, that are you really free to use? If you are got an Android phone, like a Motorola phone, HTC produced phone, you have to use their software development kit to actually access through the interface for the phone. But Android is open source. It's free. But it's linked with the hardware. So the way, in fact, they provide the SDK for free, which is nice. In fact, in the beginning, Apple tried to sell you in order to use the iPhone and go through the SDK to actually make apps for the iPhone. In fact, you still have to. You have to pay like $100 for a developer's license to use it, unless you're in education and you get it for free. Well, actually, I have a free one. But uh, and it, long story short, they pay you, excuse me, you pay them $100 to use it, and then you pay them if you want to publish an app. I don't know what it costs, but they get a profit of every app that you make, which is why people kind of shied away from that. Well, Come on, this is the business aspect of software engineering. We're in it to make money, right? <laughs> so that's one of the newest ways of taking kind of embedded hardware dependent software that might be free, but not free in the end. Free to the user, free to some certain point of view, but nothing can really be free, can it, if you want to make money off of it. So Apple's biggest thing is, is in the software, not really in the hardware. It's, they don't care. They're making money on the developers. They're making money on a percentage of everybody who puts an app in that store. And you can't put anything on the phone unless it goes through the app store, which is why a whole bunch of people said, oh, forget that. You know, I, I don't want that. I want to go with the Android model. And I'm going to do that. And great. So now we have two competing markets. So we have competition. I don't know if you can't really say one is better than the other. I've tried them both. I could say they're probably about equal. I would say there's more variety in Android apps that you can download, but there's more quality in the Apple stuff, I think, and more censorship in the Apple stuff than there is in the Android stuff. But long story short, what we're looking at is a model of delivering, upgrading, standardizing, working with, selling SDKs for software that's really closely tied to the hardware in an embedded kind of environment. So the product is seen by the user as a hardware product. We buy the iPhone, we buy the HTC phone, but we're really actually getting software. So even though the software development is a major part of the cost of it, it's still the hardware that they're buying. And it's kind of like the whole iPod. What would an iPod be without iTunes <laughs> for the most part? And we're buying, what are we buying? We're buying the hardware, we're buying the iPod. So Apple's what they're selling hardware. Most, 90% of the revenue is actually coming, and I shouldn't say 90, I don't know exactly how much, is coming from iTunes sales. I think they make more money download, every time someone downloads a song and pays a buck for it than they do on every piece of hardware that they sell, every one of those iPods. But we're buying, the consumer's perception is the hardware. So going back to other products, you know, GPS systems in your car, um, smartphones, and you know, it's all about the features on that phone. It's not about the phone. So in a lot of ways, a lot of software development is hidden behind hardware these days. The point I'm trying to make is the business model is all associated with the hardware. Software looks like from the consumer's perspective as the afterthought, but the software is probably the driving force of the product, like those iPods. It's all about iTunes. It's all about selling stuff through iTunes and the revenue generated from that. The uh, iPod is just a convenience. <laughs> it's just a way of delivering the, uh, the feature to the customer, collecting the money from the customer. Examples, global positioning systems, uh, automobile engine controls. Yeah, most of the engines in American cars these days, it's all about, now it's all about the features. It's all about, can you update, there was a commercial recently, Guy, I guess there's a new car out where you can integrate your car through audio voice. The guy comes out from a date or something and he checks a Facebook status through something. I, I think it was in his rear view mirror or something. I don't know where the controller was or whatever. But it's all about this application about being able to update your Facebook status or your check something in your car while driving down the street instants, seconds after you just finished this date or something. Um, there's another one, you know, where the guy is like, you know, a radio. It's just a hardware device. It's a radio. But he can, you know, voice recognition. 
play Madonna or something, and it plays a song for him or whatever. Now, you know, that's just the start of it. GPS is just the start of it. Now we got cars that back up to park themselves. Well, software-oriented. It's the software that's running the hardware device. So a lot of software engineering in the future, it's all about the hardware. It's all about making the component work, giving it features. And the software's really just giving it features, essentially, and functionality. Talked about outsourcing already. And just a few minor points to kind of conclude with on this topic as a, a concept. Somebody else developing the benefits. Well, we can go through it. Um, a little better uh, organization. Well, without even reading through any of this stuff on the advantages and the disadvantages, you could probably just go from your own personal experiences on it. If you're outsourcing, you don't have to have the core competency. You don't have to be a software development company to get software written for you these days. So we have another set of entire businesses that are just about outsourcing everything, but they're the people that with the business concept, which is why outsourcing actually kind of fails. So you might be thinking, well, she just said it works well, and then she just said it fails. It works well for some things that aren't part of the core business activity. And because why are you going to hire those people? You can just get them when you need them. But there are some businesses out there that have outsourced their whole business concept. They're running off of, like, for example, service organizations, call center organizations. So you're running a call center for companies, and you're working with somebody else's software application that's doing some intelligent routing, let's say, or it's doing some call capturing, or it's doing some calculating statistics. It's a program that's running on a switch or something or a network that is providing a feature that your company is using as their core business concept, essentially. That's when it's working these days. And that outsource company that you're working with might only be working with you. So are they just an extension of your company and you're not making them part of your company? Are they a partnership? An example of that would be sort of like the eBay PayPal. They were two separate companies. Some guy came up with a concept. Actually, it was one guy and his business partner came up with PayPal. And uh, actually, it was kind of smart of eBay to buy them, because why pay this guy over and over again? And he would have made more money if he didn't know. Um, but I don't know what they sold the company for, but I guess he wanted out of it. I don't know. Long story short, it's a guy who was selling a software solution that eBay was using. He came up with the idea. He was able to get eBay to buy him, essentially. Now it's all under the same house, but a lot of stuff runs that way. The trend of the future is your outsource. Yeah, PayPal is an outsource company that eBay was using. So, it's by the outsource company. So there's a fine line between outsourcing done for good cause and outsourcing done in the wrong way. So if you're using the concept correctly, it's still a viable option. Some of the dis disadvantages, um, you know, the outsource company may not have the same goals as the organization. Might be working in a different direction. Might not see. Uh, long-term relationship with a company, which is an issue, which I think is probably more why eBay wanted to acquire PayPal, because they integrate, they're well integrated. And in fact, like the shipping modules, everything is kind of well fit together, makes everything work nicely. What happens if PayPal went away? <laughs> PayPal went broke or something happened, or PayPal decides to work with Amazon or something, or you know, works with other companies. You know, so there's some strategic advantages to not outsourcing, not having it that way. But unless you're looking at those things, you wouldn't be able to make the decision on that whether or not you want actually wanted to acquire them. So what does that say on the bottom? Organizations need to consider in-house expertise to oversee the work. Yeah, must not overestimate the expertise of the software house as well. It's like shows up and says, "Hey, nice, we can do this, we can do that, we can do this," but they can't really do anything at all. You don't really know them, per se. So, you know. Freelance software development. Well, this is where a lot of people start out with. And this is one of the bad examples I was getting you earlier with. A lot of, this is where people start, they fail, and then they decide, oh, software engineering is not for me. I want to go work for a company. Because I make more money working for the company, because then I can take lunch when I want to take lunch and not worry about my hourly rate kind of thing. So. You and a friend create a company, develop software, and you're offered a contract to write B-stroke software. Actually, this is a true example. How much are you going to charge per hour? <laughs> People just come up with these numbers. Oh, $45, $50. Really? 
they flip a coin, plan to work 40 hours a week or for 50 hours a week a year, you want to earn something, you know, this is how much you got to charge an hour. But can you really determine that? And it's actually kind of like when students do homework. I am, you know, actually, when I was a student a long, long, long time ago, I used to like to try to predict ahead of time. In fact, you guys are doing it. You guys did it this morning. I saw a lot of you mentally calculating. Hmm, five assignments, okay. Not due till April, okay. Uh, final exam in class. All right, so I got to show up for the final. I know that for sure. So, okay, all right, all right, okay. And that's a final. I can do that take home. It's not bad. I can do the essay. Not bad. In fact, you know, two or three weeks right in the middle of the term. Not bad. Five, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Half of you, half of you already have it planned out. You're going to wait till the first part of April till before you even start thinking about the assignments. Other people are thinking about, actually, I have two guys I talked to who have already finished. But in my day, my weekday, they've already finished everything. It's like, well, you're all done. Because they, they were thinking oppositely, and they were thinking, you know, they, they want to know how much time so that they can play the rest of the term. So they got everything done in the beginning so they can just forget about it till the end. So, but I actually would do the opposite. I would do what you guys are doing, thinking, okay, I don't have to start on anything. I can go home after today, come back April. Yeah, April, that's it. I'm all done. I'm, right. I'm free to go. <laughs> Only problem is, is when you start looking at it and when you start doing it, so some of you will actually be smart and actually kind of look at it ahead of time and go, all right, what are these assignments all about, first of all? How much work is it going to cost? I mean, how much time is it going to take me to do this? And then that's when you start, start learning from experience as well as a student. You know, oh, and then you actually have your own routine. You have your own method. Long story short, I'm getting to... You have your own methodology for dealing with it, and it's usually from experience. Because either you got burned, or you couldn't do everything at the last minute, or you know from previous times that it works out a certain way for you. Either you do it all up front, or you do it at the end. This is what software development companies do, hopefully. They know from every time, any other project that they've worked on, they know how many hours it takes to do something. And, if it, and then they compare. And that's how you actually end up with a good working methodology. Because if you've taken another class like this before and you know you have these five assignments, whatever, you know how long it took you last time. And so you figure out, well, what worked well and what didn't work well. You know, oh, it worked better if I just did them all up front, or it worked better if I just waited, you know. And then you repeat the process over and over and over again. And that's what that CMM model actually kind of works with, how it judges how well a company can repeat successfully and actually can go through. And you as a student, the more classes you take, the more degrees you get, blah, 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 you know, the better you estimate out everything, time-wise, effort, content. You know, you assess everything all the way down to how many hours is it going to take you to actually get the grade you want for the course. <laughs> so. Which is what software companies do. Here it is here. But the thing that you don't calculate in, actually, <coughs> As a student, you're probably not calculating your rent, your food. Your, you probably are calculating gas, maybe, and the cost of your airline ticket, perhaps. But all these other expenses that play into the factor, how much did it really cost me to get that degree? And what, 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 what opportunities did it give me? Well, I got to go to the U.S., so that's a big one. That's a big selling point. But, you know, what did it cost you? Maybe there's other options that you could have compared it with if you saw the big picture up front, which is a lot of, like people do that a lot when they make big purchases. Later, they kind of compare, they kind of compare, and they go, oh, well, I would do it again, or no, nah, I think I'd buy that one instead of this one or something if I were to do it again. Well, here we have uh, hourly rate. If this freelance company calculated it out $25, calculated everything, oh, it's really $80. But they don't know this till after the fact. And you come back and you say, oh, well, you can't change the contract. This is what you sold it for. So this is what you're collecting from the customer. So and when we talk about the legal aspect of business, uh, later, probably not until after the lunch break, then you'll see, well, did I get them to sign on the dotted line correctly? <laughs> did they actually agree to give me 25? Or can I change it to 80 now? You know, what, what happens at that point? No, you can't change it to 80, usually. So. All right, I don't have to go through all these expenses. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? It's all the hidden hidden expenses. This is what happens with freelance software development. You must have a contract with the customer, uh, and it may be a simple letter or a complex agreement. 
Usually, I, what I like to do, actually, and this is kind of sloppy, and feel free to take a break. I see people leaving. <laughs> if you must. I know I'm, I'm going to break after this lecture, but it's not for another five or six more slides. Anyway, here's what I generally do. If you know you've got to go through a methodology, you have what, at a minimum, you're going to have a statement of work, maybe, which is kind of like a free form of a requirement spec, but without the requirements. Because what, you know, let's say you put an ad up on Craigslist or you answer an ad on Craigslist or you go to rentacoder.com and you say, oh, okay, I want to do this job. Okay. So you put together this contract. Here's what everybody does. You know, they go out and they look, oh, internet, statement of work, requirement spec. Oh, that's what it looks like. You download somebody else's and you change it to look like yours. Concept being you're, you're trying to protect yourself. But here's what I like to do, actually. So, Go ahead, if you're thinking about doing the project, it's like, why wait? Why say $25 now when it's going to be $80 and you don't want to say $25? So instead, you put together the requirements spec. You actually start the project. Start the work first and go by putting together a list of requirements and actually specking it out. And then you start putting dollar, and you will always come out with a higher figure. <laughs> And then the customer comes back and says, well, why are you charging $80? This other guy said he's going to do $25. And then you can actually show them the, the work that you've done so far. And you can say, hey, look, here's my requirement spec that I've come out with. And this is all the features you're asking for. And this is what you want me to implement. And I've calculated out, you know, two days for this, three days for that. Believe it or not, the more accurate information you actually give the customer that actually sees, they know that you've actually looked into it, the more willing they are, they will actually hire you for the $80 <laughs> versus the $25. Because this guy over here who said $25 has, maybe has no idea what you're talking about. Because what they don't want, and this is the weird thing that happens with software, they don't want their deadline to come up two weeks later and not have anything. They really want to buy it. So they don't want to get stuck in a situation where they bought it. They thought they bought it, but they're never going to get it. It's not going to be delivered correctly, or they're not going to get what they asked for. Because what nobody, everyone's going to take credit for what they, you know, the person who hired you to do the job is going to take the credit for your work. They want to make sure that you're actually going to do good work because they're putting their name on it. And so then you're going to deliver it. So the trick to, long story short, the trick to freelance is looking intelligent. <laughs> Justifying your costs, actually going through a methodology, and we have an entire lecture on costing, to actually come out with a set of requirements. Come and it takes a lot more work. Yeah, it's a lot more work than a simple reply. Oh, twenty-five dollars an hour, ten dollars an hour, or flat fee, five hundred dollars. I'll write this for you. It actually comes out, and it, because it gives the customer more guarantee that they're going to get, and they'll pay more money for a better guarantee for better quality software. And there's nothing to say that your coding has nothing to do with the quality of your source code writing. In fact, they don't even know. In their mind, it's all the same. Programmer is a programmer. And anyone can write the same thing. So where you get them is in the contract or in the agreement. So you must have an agreement. There are some people who don't actually have an agreement or a contract or even think about this stuff. They just say, oh, yeah, I'll do it for you. And then they come over and they take another advantage which is not what is very typical these days, but it used to happen and it stopped happening because customers got smart. People answered ads and said, oh yeah, I'll do it for you. We're gonna bring it, bring it by next week. Okay, and then they showed up and it was a bribery. Here it is, you want it? You gotta pay me this how much, this is what you're gonna pay me for it. And it was like, it was like selling a used car almost. It was like almost like a bribe that happened with, yeah, I got your solution, here it is. And it, they were like, you know, trying to get as much as I could for it. It's like, well, how long did it take you to write? And then customers got smart and said, no, 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 you're telling me right now how much it's going to cost and where you're going to deliver it to me. <laughs> I'm not taking the bribe anymore because they got stuck. The manager got stuck in a situation. Well, I need to deliver this. My boss is looking for this. You know, I got to pay what? So, so what should it contain? Also, you know, it should be contain, you know, paid by hour, paid by the completion of the job. What acceptance testing? Who owns the software? That's an interesting question. Who owns it? What licenses does the other party have? Uh, who provides the hardware software requirements? 
And uh, when will you get your money? That's what the statement of work's all about. It says, I'm going to do this, and you're going to pay me three, three installments. You're going to pay me on this date, this date, and this date, and I'm going to deliver mm -hmm. this to you, this, this to you, this. There's an entire art to this. In fact, this is when software engineers need to take business law. <laughs> you actually have to know how to write a contract, put a date on it, put both parties on it. There's certain parts of it. You can get one of those NOLO books, I think they used to call it, or they how to write a software contract book. And you can actually teach yourself this um, because very important because when all is said and done, it's the contract that gets, it's how you get your money essentially because you're not going to get any money unless you've got some legal right to it. So, Which may not if you don't treat software like a business. So. But I have an entire lecture on that so we have more of that to come. Uh, fixed and variable cost package software. Interesting. Actually, another part here is the consideration and the disclosure of any external source code or any external licensing that might be needed for anything. As an example, these companies that put together programs that you're building that do encoding or that do some manipulation of something or that work with something that require a particular license to something. So letting the customer know, yeah, my program works fine, but you didn't buy the license to Oracle. This just interfaces with Oracle. You also have to buy Oracle for my program to work with it. Otherwise, the customer come back and say, I know you sold me Oracle too. <laughs> nope, didn't sell you Oracle. Just sold you the front end of the program that works with Oracle. Yeah. That actually, that could end you in a situation, in fact, there's a couple, there was a textbook that did cost, a costing textbook that had an example, I can't remember the name of the book, had an example where the customer was under the impression that they were getting this database system along with the interface to it, and it was actually for a web application. And what ended up happening is the company that sold them the program ended up having to, and they went to court and sued, and they actually ended up having to pay them so that they could buy you know, the company ended up buying the software that was supposed to accompany their application because, you know, they sold it as part of their application. So they, in a long story short, they ended up costing them more money than it did to actually make the software. So, because they ended up having to buy Oracle for them, buy this for them as well, <laughs> so they could have a complete solution. And that was really never part of the agreement. Uh, the variable and the fixed cost package software, as an example, the initial development cost of the software product is a million dollars. The cost of packaging and distributing each copy is five dollars. You got the technical support cost, fifteen dollars a copy. The package sells for two hundred dollars per copy. Mm. Variable cost is twenty dollars. So you have different costing patterns and different estimates that you have to make in terms of am I going to provide support for this? Nowadays, there's no support. Because in the old days, it was too difficult. You know, was it one year, two year, And then phasing out. Actually, if you read your software license agreements, it usually tells you exactly. But who reads it? It tells you exactly how many years they're going to support it for, what, what any additional costs that might be associated with it, what liability the company has. And you don't, no one ever buys software. <laughs> well, that's the interesting part. I mean, even when you buy software from a company that's making it for you, do you really own the software? It depends on what you're buying. Because nobody owns the programming language. I mean, other than the programming language company. When you buy software that's prepackaged, when you down, you're licensing it. Nobody ever owns it. The person who owns it is the person who created it. So, by, by default. It's your own copyrighted material. And, I mean, unless you actually have a contract that transfers your copyright from person who wrote software to person who obtained and uses software. You own, you don't own the software. <laughs> well, a lot of technical issues with that, actually. Yeah? Oh. What is that responsibility for the writer or the company who buys it? Interesting. That's, an, that's another interesting legal issue is let's say there's a bug in the code. And the person who owns the code is the person who wrote the code by default. So, and the person sells the code to somebody else, and the bug causes major damage to the person. That's where the software license agreement comes into play, and that's why we have software license agreements. So it depends on what's in the software license agreement as to who's liable and who owns what. Generally, those, lease, those agreements say, 
you're using it, you have the right to use it, but you don't own it. And anything that happens to your computer is your fault. <laughs> Not in those words, but that's essentially what the agreement is telling you. Who's fault? The programmer's fault? Or the no, computer? the user, the person who did it. It's, it's, it's whoever is using the software is at fault. So if you bought a program that had a bug, it deleted everything on your hard drive, you can't go back to the person who wrote the program and say, hey, you deleted everything on my hard drive. Because you, you, you signed a software license agreement. You know that one that's like 12 pages long and 0.5 font? <laughs> and it had a default button that said agree, and then an okay button that you just click, okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's what told you that anything that happens on your computer is your fault. <laughs> what about the source code to uh, provide platform to write codes? They don't own any authority for that? No, because when you sign as a programmer, when you sign the license agreement to install the compiler on your program, you agreed to anything that you write that causes that is your fault. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a funnel, you know, like some of the stuff comes in this way and it goes funnels out, funnels out. It says so there's nothing at the end. <laughs> this is like how liability works. Every layer relinquishes liability to the next layer underneath it, relinquishes it from the next layer underneath it, relinquish it, to the point where nobody's liable for anything, except for the end user. You're responsible for everything that happens. But there was a high profile case against Microsoft and it had something, and I can't, this is like way, way, way back in the old days. It had, right before, before Windows, and it had something to do with a program that did something that, that made their computer not work for something else. It was like one of those terminate state resident programs where it, it, it took the memory and allocated it towards something and you couldn't use it for some, you couldn't use the computer for some, and some crazy user said, just because I have this installed, how come I can't run this program along with it? It was like way, way back in the beginning. And it was like kind of one of those landmark cases because it came back and said, well, just because that's working doesn't make Microsoft responsible for everything else on your computer. And then everyone started thinking, oh, license agreement. Ooh. You know, we were starting to think about the legal aspect of this. What's going on? And then that's when it, all this chaos started. And then it has basically resolved down to nobody has, nobody has responsibility for anything. And nobody's liable for anybody as long as you've signed your rights away. <laughs> What's funny now is everyone who writes software, you can cut and paste it off it common, uh, actually there's websites where you can cut and paste a license agreement that just relinquishes all of your responsibility. And you put that in there and you say, customer, do you agree to this? If you don't agree to this, you can't install my software. Of course they're going to agree to it. <laughs> and when they agree to it, it says, well, we're not responsible for anything my software does to your program, to your life, to your bank account, to anything. So, well, think about it. You know, Quicken. You know, what if you made a mistake in the software application and you accidentally transferred money to the wrong account? It wasn't your account or something? Quicken, are they going to be responsible for that? No. Why should they? Use your error. <laughs> or, you know, you, you, you wrote your term paper and your computer died and Microsoft Word scrambled your paper. You couldn't print it out, turned it in. You failed school. You lost your loan. You got deported from the country. And your parents don't like you anymore. Is the company going to be responsible for that? <laughs> Nobody. So we have the fixed cost, going back to the cost, profit, and loss. Fixed cost, variable cost. Here's the other interesting part. It's kind of like manufacturing. That's why software development is sort of like manufacturing a product. You got to, okay, so if you're going to manufacture a product, you have to set up an assembly line if you're going to do it yourself. I don't know. You have to set up some equipment. You got to get some parts. You got to buy the pieces. You got to pay for the labor before you get any product to come out. You have all the startup time, the planning, the building, the making the product, and then you finally got a box full of products to sell. You send it out there and you get money for it. So those are essential fixed costs that are over here accumulating. Same thing with software. It's not. But contrary to outsourcing popular belief, it's not built in a day or a weekend or a week. Most software development projects take between six months and two years to build, average being a year and a half or so, a little bit over a year. So 
what is this is this whole year that's going on <laughs> until you actually get to the point where you can make some revenue and you're hoping this line is going to be steep this is what ends up happening and there's a couple of books on time within budget it's one of the name of the books uh, the other one is um, I can't remember. It's it's very popular. There's a couple of books that are on the market that are very popular, if I can remember. They get in the concept of when to stop. When to throw your hands up and cut your losses. Because think about it. You're developing a software project. It's taken you a year and a half. Automatically, you know ahead of time. It's not even a matter of it being late. You know it's going to take you at least a year. So here's your one year. At the half point between the year you've got to decide is it worth continuing or am I going to take my money right now at this point and buy a brand new Mercedes <laughs> am I going to probably going to get more money out of the car more excuse me more enjoyment more life satisfaction out of spending my money on the car than I would if I finished this project given the fact that if I made it to this point I might actually fail so there's an entire strategy to cutting your losses early not being afraid to cancel the project given some statistics and some calculations that you could go through and this is project by project there's no one formula that's going to work there's no mathematical calculation like you know present income or <laughs> future <laughs> you like what you can do with accounting to figure out what your money's going to be worth instead you have to actually kind of know the development process a little bit better or actually that's why you take software engineering courses so you can figure out whether it's better to buy the car or continue. And then as your diminishing returns happen, at some point, you're not your revenue because what it took you a year, but now you have different requirements. Now the internet access is, let's say, faster. We don't need your product anymore. Or now your product has to work with the internet. Or now as you're developing, we have somebody else who's got a better product than yours coming out at the same time that didn't exist one year ago. So a lot of software engineering books actually focus on what happens between the start and the delivery and focuses all of the efforts on that. Because if you think about the concept, and because we're talking about the business aspect of software engineering, <laughs> that's the business aspect right there. It has nothing to do with the product actually being completed. Sometimes it's better to st stop. Sometimes it's better to shift gears, shift product concepts change everything on the fly than to wait. Sometimes it's better to wait to get there and then if you know your revenue is going to be high enough, work with the revenue stream. So, In fact, um, a good example of that was uh, HP actually came out with this cable modem you know, before Comcast did in this area. They were the ones that were going to do modem cable over the coax and uh, they stopped. They abandoned it in an about six months later, Comcast came out with theirs. <laughs> so, Comcast cable slash internet access combo box, which was a better better option. In fact, that's not made by Comcast anyway, but they're the ones who are licensing it, uh, which is probably what you're familiar with. But anyway, long story short, they decided it was better just to cancel it, just to stop it completely, than it was to compete. Even though they probably could have made a good product, but they're not in the cable business. They don't know anybody in the cable business. How are they going to sell their internet access? How are they going to sell their router with cable? It's better to have a better strategic alliance with a cable company for a company like that who's going to sell a modem or sell um, set top box. Yeah. I this suppose one? Uh, we have a product which we have outsourced to a company. Mm -hmm. I mean, that company is supposed to do that work. And say that company says that, you know, we're going to take a year or more than a year to complete that project. Uh, I mean, if we go back to the, I mean, the previous slide which we were at, then, uh, I mean, how can we come at that crossing point and, you know, can just, uh, you know? That's when, in the contract, you decide at milestone points, mm -hmm. you're going to get progress updates. Here's the other thing that happens commonly with outsourced companies. You pay the deposit, the company's working on it, they say it's going to take you a year. Do you wait as a customer? Do you wait a year? In the meantime, you're like, your entire business is relying upon the software solution that they're building or something, or it's a major component, it's costing you a lot of money, but you don't know. That's when it's a little bit more complicated than, here, just sign on the dotted line. So if the customer actually has to think about, well, 
what am I going to get? Am I going to get a prototype? Am I going to get um, proof of concept? Am I going to get a demo? And you space it out, and you're actually writing it into the contract. Otherwise, there's no requirements. In fact, the company can actually just take this as a long-term capital investment, saying, well, you're going to give us 50 grand okay, in a year and a half, I have to give it back <laughs> because we know we're going to fail. Let's just take your 50 grand and invest it in the stock market and play with it, and then we'll have your 50 It's like a loan. You can treat, I mean, it's kind of unethical. Well, there's companies that do, used to do that, actually, until customers got smart and said, just show me some proof. Yeah, the other thing um, is what Google does. If it's going to take you a year, actually, just think about Gmail. You guys all use Gmail, right? The first time you looked at Gmail, well, I don't know. Maybe some of you, the first time you looked at Gmail, it wasn't even half of what it is today. It was maybe one or two features. In fact, I think it used to be integrated. No, that was Mosea. One of them used to be integrated with the web browser. I think it was when Mozilla came out with the first couple of versions of uh, Netscape. We had email in the web browser, and that was webmail. We could actually access And then we had Gmail. Oh, it's on, you know, actually Yahoo came out with it first, but and Hotmail was out first before Gmail. But the concept of what Gmail was providing was new, but it didn't do anything. It didn't have an address book, contact list, any of the integration that it has now. But instead of waiting a year, they actually got it out now. They got it out instantly. Like all of their, in fact, as a current example, you can say all the mapping stuff they're doing. Half the people don't know the utility to it yet because the utility's not out there yet. <laughs> but eventually we'll have applications that are using it. But the, their concept was instead of waiting until this revenue point, which they don't even have revenue on it yet, they will in the future, uh, especially when concepts like Google Voice, something like that, there's been speculation that they were going to start charging in January. They still haven't started charging yet. But their concept is get it out, get the people locked in, what does that do? It gives them a higher chance of meeting the revenue stream points, and it gives them long-term <coughs> acceptance growth. They already have a product out. They didn't wait a year or two years for it. People started using it. People are locked in. How many people are going to give up their Gmail account? None of you are. <laughs> How much information have you given, Google? Tons of it. How many yeah. products can they sell you in the future? A ton. Yeah? It's the software development methodology. It's like the models we have been using for you know, quite long. Like, I mean, initially we <coughs> work on that waterfall model. I mean, there it was not the... Uh, oh, water, you can't use a waterfall model for exactly, Google. Exactly, we cannot, yeah. Use, yeah. We cannot use that. Of we course not. We can or the uh, spiral or prototype, right? You'd have to use an evol evolutionary prototyping model, mm -hmm. which is what Google... Every, every product that Google puts out is evolutionary. Okay. In fact, even Gmail today is still growing. In fact, you see a lot of growing. New feature coming soon. Try this, try that. What I really like is the Google Voice, actually. Um, and that was like their first revenue streaming. I, they haven't started charging for it yet, but there was speculation that at January 1st they're going to start because so many people are using it now, and it's really nice. And there's other products on the market you have to pay for that does the same thing. So, but we'll wait. Actually, there was a legal issue there because... If you're, not, if you're not familiar with the whole Google concept, they're owning all of the data in the world. <laughs> they're a data mining company. <laughs> so you, well, you're all shaking your head. Yeah, you know that already. Yeah. But some people are okay with giving away their data as long as they can get a service that's free that goes along with it. Only problem is after you've given away all your data, then they're going to start charging you for it in the future. Just wait. Eventually, they're going to make a ton of money. They're still, they're, they're, they're still growing. They're, they're right here right now. They're still waiting. They're, every, everything's free right now. Just wait. <laughs> so I keep saying. Well, people would like that. I certainly would. I want to know what my competitors are doing. Whether or not you're getting correct information depends on your techniques. 
Are you sending a spy in? Are you because uh, people do that? There's all sorts of different tricks. The concept, if you could actually know exactly what everybody was doing, then there would be no competition. There would be no game. But that's not really a reality, and no one's going to tell you. So it's kind of a gamble. It's 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 it's, it's a, any other business aspect that would apply towards any other industry is the same concept. Oh, someone's always going to the, the Amer American expression used to be, "Can you build a better mousetrap?" Was, someone's always going to build a better mousetrap because it, it's the nature of competition. Someone's always going to come out with something better. So you have to stay one step ahead of your competition. So. In software, it's hard to do that because it's like building a product. And unless you can figure out how to build it quickly, which is like companies like Google and rapid, app, rap, rapid application development, prototyping, some of those strategies are used to essentially put your product out earlier before it's finished. And you can get into, and this is mostly the Software Engineering 1 concepts, but the different software development methodologies that promote different characteristics, shorter, you know, things we just talked about. There's other techniques that you can use throughout the development process to improve the likelihood of a, an event occurring the way you want it to occur in the future. So stay ahead of your competition, reduce your costs, stuff like that. So profit and loss is all associated with risks. So I don't even have to, you don't have to read the slide to know that. Cash flow and risk. So if you sell 7,500 copies, do you make a profit of $350,000? Maybe that's what it costs you. Who knows? Did you borrow money to cover the startup period? How much did you invest? Uh, how much invest interest did you pay on the money itself? And what about taxes, cash flow? Taxes, that's an interesting thing with software. <laughs> what are you being taxed on? What kind of royalties do you have to pay? Sometimes you can add up all the royalties for interfacing, for using drivers, for different components, and that costs you more than what you could sell the software for because somebody else might actually be taking a cut on your software, especially if you're working with a product that, let's say, works with a hardware device that you don't own the platform for. That's what makes software... In, excuse me, software engineering as a business, interesting. Because other businesses can be on an island of their own. Software is never on an island of their own. You're always working with an operating system. You're always working on a platform. So you have other people in the market who are determining your livelihood. Because even, in, let's say, for example, even if you make a Windows software application, how do you know Windows is going to stay the same? <laughs> You got Windows 7, you know, XP, and that's pretty stable. In fact, if you made an XP application, you're sitting pretty good right now because your XP is still supported. If you made one for ME, for 95, 98, you, you're gone. You're not, make, you're not in the software business anymore unless you've changed, unless you've updated. Cash flow, when are you going to get paid? Always late. Uh, when do you have the bills right now? When do you pay bills right now? So you have the risk. You have the risk that uh, what extra costs do you have? if the product is a year late, and then you have that big old cost. What happens if you're late in, in your contract you don't have any contingency plans? You don't have any, anything that helps you. You know, all of a sudden you realize they don't have to pay you a dime because you didn't deliver. It's not like if someone was actually building a house for you. Let's say you bought a piece of land and you contracted out a company to build a house. You're going to have an unfinished house sitting on your land. <laughs> that you're going to have to pay someone to finish. You can't just walk away from it. Software you can easily walk away from. So you can be a company and you can hire five different companies to build your software program and only pay for one. If only one of them delivers it and the other ones you're not satisfied with, you can walk away from it. If you have a car and you pay a mechanic to fix it, you have to pay for it. You can't walk away from it. Especially, otherwise, you can't take possession of your car if you don't pay your bill. You can take possession of software. People do it all the time. They download stuff from the Internet. And then they pay for it. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. You know, it's a lot easier to get away with paying for it in terms of software, which also makes it unique as a business. The risks associated with it, um, if you sell extra copies, fewer copies, someone pirates your software, there's no, there's no money in it for you. Revenue stream up and down. Unorthodox business. Unorthodox business models, shareware. So you're a shareware company, 
and uh, your producer writes a software package. You distribute it. The distribution is open, uh, but requests a fee, let's say $50 for a service. This is how antivirus software actually in the beginning ran. Yeah, you bought, the, you got the software for free, but if you wanted updates, you paid for it. In fact, Norton still runs the same way. Yeah. Semantic still sells Norton the same way. If spyware software and antivirus software, you have to pay for the updates. Um, that's actually expensive compared to I any mean, you're giving a software for free. But yeah, you know, anyway, users who pay a fee get a small benefit, no message. So. If you buy the, in terms of the shareware concept, shareware's not bad, don't, don't get me wrong on that. In fact, open source is fantastic. I'm highly supportive of open source software. Demo software, shareware software is slightly different. They're giving you a little bit, but they're not giving you the whole thing. When you pay for the whole thing, you know. Anyway, they take a message away, they make it work. There's so many cheating with people taking shareware and violating the, you know, not paying for it, the key cracks, the key gens, all the stuff that can be used to get through software. Some people have received substantial revenue this way from making software and putting it out there and selling you half the program, but never even finishing it, perhaps. I don't know. Open source is good. It's not a business practice. When this is an orthodox business model, it doesn't, it's just not a traditional business model. It has never existed outside of software. We can't get open source anything. Can you buy any other product open source? No. <laughs> so it's not traditional. You can get free trials, free samples, actually. I guess you could. You know, when you get in the mail, those little things of detergent and stuff. That's open source. Well, not open source. It's free. Shareware. Shareware software. Uh, let's see. Linux, Apache, Perl. As long as you abide by the agreement. In fact, a lot of development Java is open source. Java is a programming language. You don't, shouldn't have to pay for that. Um, you pay for IDEs, for integrated development environments or tools. In fact, some of the tools are free too, like NetBeans, and Eclipse is free. I say open source, I shouldn't say free. Uh, but what ends up happening is a lot of people take open source and they ship it, or they include it, or they build a product that uses open source and they steal it, which happens actually until they get around to it. And then it's like, who prosecutes them? Everybody? You know, it's usually something that's unenforceable, unfortunately. Not to tell you that so you go out there and do it, but what ends up happening is you end up with some loophole situation in which your program can't legally be sold because it violates some open source agreement because you've included a piece or a component that is part of open source. So what end up happening is you'll have a whole class action of people coming after you is what happens. <laughs> so eventually you go broke trying to settle it in court until it, they basically take you to court until you run out of money and then you end up closing your doors and getting into a different business in the soft process. So a little bit of open source notes here. Uh, software may, uh, may be open source but packaging the service can be profitable business. Red Hat as an example. They're selling Linux but it's Red Hat. <laughs> it's the desktop. It's, you know, it's whatever they're including in terms of the packaging. In fact, in the old days, people did this a lot. They took open source, they made a manual, they put it on a CD-ROM, they stuck it in a box. And we don't have boxes anymore, we don't have CD-ROMs anymore. Now we download everything from the internet. But we don't have manuals anymore either. That's nice, because programmers, they don't like to write. We don't like to write text, we like to write source code. So why are we going to write a manual? So now we don't have manuals, so it's good. I mean, you have online manuals, I shouldn't say that. It's, that was actually kind of a stab at technical writers because technical writing is a is a valuable thing and we still do need manuals. So. All right, you can go to this uh, opensource.org uh, and you can see what's open source. Search source still around, actually still very popular. There are some good quality open source out there. MySQL is open source. Tens of products that work with MySQL. So, what a lot of software developers actually do these days is find solutions. They build front ends. They build things that work with open source. They have all sorts of different um, interactions. And uh, you can't take something that's open source and turn it into a commercial software application. But you can take something that complements it, that works with it, and package that up and sell it and based on open source. So open source license agreement uh, is one of the biggest things you have to actually include it. If you don't include it, you're breaking the law, essentially. 
And I'll have more about license agreements when we talk about the legal aspect of business or software engineering. Uh, but technically, we have a free distribution. We have source code that's available, derived work that's permitted. In fact, you can actually, there's a lot of people that like to work on that, like, you know, improve something, add a feature to something. And if you say you're using MySQL, and this is how MySQL actually got so popular and so fully featured and bug free, was uh, companies were actually using it because companies like Oracle were charging too much for their database. So use an open source database, right? So companies were working on it and redistributing it, putting all of their bug fixes and all of their new features out there to the point where open, well, my, my SQL is actually fairly good as a solution to a problem. And a lot of companies are actually using it these days. So. But again, there's no security in the source code and everybody's using the same thing. But if you're writing a generic program that uses a database, what do you need a proprietary database for? You could use an open source kind of solution. So. Okay, that was an overview of the legal, uh, excuse me, the legal, it sounds like the legal, we got a whole thing on the legal. This is the business aspect of software engineering. Now what we're going to have is a lunch break for about an hour. So it's, a, it's actually about noon right now. So we're going to break until 1, 1.15ish. And uh, there's plenty of places you can go eat. I don't know if they're selling any food around here on campus. Uh, we go take a break, get something to eat. When we come back, we're going to go for uh, more topics. That was, we're actually on lecture two. So we only, we only have about three more topics left. One of them is going to be the legal aspect of business. Another one's going to be on dependability, dependability systems. The other one's going to be on reliability um, and other certain features about QA, um, which are kind of, what I was going to say, more advanced stuff. So that's what we have to uh, look forward to after the break.